and Jack in the country. Well, produce my carpet first. Here it is. Now produce your explanation and pray. Make it improbable. <laughs> my dear fellow, there is nothing improbable about my explanation at all. Over 
from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing, the four, the Albany, West, Uncle Jack's brother. Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He <laughs> seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said he was anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. Yes, yes. <laughs> I suppose you'd better talk to the housekeeper about your room for him. Yes, miss. I have never met any really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I'm so afraid he will look just like everyone else. He does. <laughs> Dear Mr. Hurt, as 
just this dark road is like a tokens. Terrible plant. My brother. More shameful deaths and extravagance. Still leaving his life with pleasure? Dead. Your brother Ernest dead? Quite dead. What a lesson for him. I trust you will profit by it. Mr. <coughs> <laughs> Werner, well, I offer you my sincere condolences. You have at least the consolation to know you are always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest. He had many faults, but it is a sad, sad blow. Very sad. Were you with him at the end? No. He died abroad in Paris, in fact. I received a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. Is the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. <laughs> As a man so, so let him breathe. Charity in this prison. Charity. None of us are perfect. I myself am severely susceptible to jobs. Does the internment take place here? No, he seems to have desired it. Expect the desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris? I fear that's hardly for the same very seriously to mind of the You no doubt wish me to make some slight reading to try to domestic affliction next summer. My sermon on the meaning of the man in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion. Joyful, or the perfect distressing. I have preached it at harvest separations, christenings, confirmations, days of communication, and festivals. That reminds me, Dr. Charles I think you mentioned christenings. I suppose you know how to christen all right. I mean, you are continually christening, aren't you? But is there any particular infant in whom you are interested? Your brother was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. But it is not for any child, dear doctor. I'm very fond of children. No, the fact is, I would like to be christened myself for this afternoon, if you have nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Wood, you have been christened already. I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> have you any doubts on the subject? I certainly intend to have. Unless, of course, it would be a father to you, or if you think I'm a little too old now. Not at all, not at all. The sprinkling and indeed the immersion of adults is a perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? You need have no apprehensions, Mr. Wayne. The sprinkling is all that is necessary, and indeed, I think advisable. A weather is so changeable. At what hour would you like the ceremony performed? Oh, I might trot around about five, if that would suit you. Perfectly, perfect. I have two similar ceremonies to perform at that hour. A case of twins that could recently when he found nine villages on your own estate and poor gentleman to catch it most hard to get on. Oh, I don't see much fun of being christened along with other babies. It would be childish. Would half past five do? Admiral, Admiral. And now, dear Mr. Raymond, I would really beg you not to be too bad down by you. But it seems to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. It seems to me a blessing of an extremely <coughs> obvious crime. Uncle Jack! Oh, I'm pleased to see you back! What hard clothes have you got on? Do go and change them. Cecily! <laughs> my child, my child. What is the matter, Uncle Jack? Do look happy. You look as if you had a toothache. And I have such a surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother. Who? My brother, Ernest. He arrived about half an hour ago. What nonsense? I have got a brother. Oh, don't say that. However badly he may behave to you in the past, he is still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come out. And you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? These are very joyful titles. After we'd all moved on to his loss, the return seems to me particularly distressing. My brother in the dining room? I don't know what it all means. I think it's perfectly absurd. <laughs> Good heavens! Brother John! I have come down from town to say that I'm very sorry for the trouble I've given you, and that I intend to live a better life in the future. Uncle Jack, you are not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think his coming down here is disgraceful. He knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, who we don't know And surely there must be much good in one who is kind to an invalid who leaves the presence of London to sit by a bed of pain. Oh, he has been talking to you about Bunbury, has he? Oh, well, he's told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Bunbury. Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury or about anything else. It is enough to drive one perfectly frantic. I admit the thoughts were all on my side. But I must say, I find Brother John's coldness me peculiarly painful. <coughs> I expect a more enthusiastic welcome, especially considering this is the first time I've been here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. <laughs> <sighs> but the 
this is the last time I shall ever do so. It is pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? I think we might move the two brothers together. Certainly you will come with us. Certainly, Mr. Oh. My little cast of reconciliation is over. You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. We must not be premature on our judgments. I feel very happy. Oh. Algy, you young scoundrel! You have got to get out of this place as soon as possible. I don't allow any thunder in here. <coughs> I have put Mr. Ernest's things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose this is all right. What? <laughs> Mr. Ernest's <laughs> luggage, sir. I have unpacked it and put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. <laughs> Thank you. 
upon your incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, <laughs> devotedly, and hopelessly. I don't think you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Cecily! The carriage is waiting, sir. Tell it to come round next week at the same hour. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you, you were staying on till next week at the same hour. Oh, I don't care about Jack. I don't care about anyone in the whole world but you. You will marry me, won't you, Cecily? You silly boy, of course. Why, we've been engaged for the last three months. <laughs> for the last three months? Yes, we'll make a in three months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And of course, a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him after all. I dare say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. Darling, and when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Before now, by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or another. And after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. The next day, I bought this little ring in your name. <laughs> And this is the bangle with a true lover's knot. I promise you always to wear. Did I give you this? Mm -hmm. It's very pretty, isn't it? Oh, yes, you've wonderfully good taste, Ernest. <laughs> it's used to I've always given you for leading such a bad life. And this is the box to achieve all your dear letters. My letters? But, my own sweet Cecily, I've never written you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well as forced to write all your letters for you. I know it's always three times a week, but sometimes oftener. Oh, do let me read them. I couldn't possibly. They would make me far too conceited. The three you wrote me after I had broken off the engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled. I can hardly read them without crying a little. But was the engagement actually broken off? Of course it was, on the 22nd of last March. You can see the entry if you like. Today, I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. <laughs> <laughs> but why on earth did you break it off? But what on earth had I done? I had done nothing at all, Cecily. Cecily, I'm very hurt indeed to hear that you broke it off. <laughs> Particularly when the weather was so charming. <laughs> it would have hardly been a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once. But I forgave you before the week was out. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. You dear romantic boy. I hope your hair curls naturally, does it? Yes. With a little help from others. <laughs> I'm so glad. You'll never break off our engagement again, Cecily. I don't think I could break it off now that I've actually met you. Besides, there's the question of your name. Oh, of course. My name. You mustn't laugh at me, darling. It has always been a girlish dream of mine to love a man whose name was Ernest. Something in that name seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. But do you mean to say you could not love me if I had some other name? But what name? Oh, any name you like. Algernon, for instance. But I don't like the name of Algernon. <laughs> I don't see why you should object to the name of Algernon. It's a rather aristocratic name. More than half the chaps who end up in bankruptcy hall have the name Algernon. <coughs> but seriously, Excellency, if I were Algy, couldn't you love me? I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character. But I fear I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. Cecily, your rector here is, I suppose, thoroughly practiced in all the rites and ceremonials of the church. Oh, yes, Dr. Charles was a most learned man. He's never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. I must leave at once on the most important christening. I mean, on important business. Oh. I shan't be away for more than half an hour. Considering we have been engaged since February the 14th, and that I only met you today for the first time, I think it is rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period as Half an hour? Can you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. What an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. I must actually to post them to my diary. Oh, Miss Fairfax. 
very important business, Miss Fairfax states. Is it Mr. Worthing in his library? <laughs> Mr. Worthing went over in the direction of the rectory <laughs> some time ago. Pray, ask the lady to come out here. Yes, miss. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Worthing will be back soon. Yes, miss. And you can bring tea. Yes, miss. <laughs> Very curious. 
or he asked me to be his wife yesterday <laughs> afternoon. Can't <laughs> 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 you verify the incident? Pray do, sir. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. I am so sorry, dear Cecily, if it is to any disappointment to you, but I am afraid that I have a prior claim. It would distress me more than I could tell you, dear Gwendolyn, <laughs> if it were to cause you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he has clearly changed his mind. If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, then I shall make it my duty to rescue him at once, and with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have got into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? This is no time for wearing a shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I'm glad to say that I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that every social spheres have been widely different. <laughs> Shall I lay the tea here as usual, miss? Yes, as usual. <laughs> Are there many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew? Oh, yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills, quite close, one can see five counties. Five counties? I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. I suppose that is why you live in town. <laughs> quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it, <coughs> Miss Fairfax. <laughs> I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. <coughs> oh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are. Personally, I cannot understand how anybody manages to exist in the country. If anybody who's anybody does, the country always bores me to death. Ah, this is what the newspapers call agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it just at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I have been told. May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you, detestable girl. <laughs> Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. <laughs> Cake or bread and butter? Bread and butter, please. Cake is rarely seen at the best houses nowadays. <laughs> Love. A moment, Ernest. Uh, May I ask you, 
Are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Good heavens to Gwendolyn. <laughs> yes, to good heavens, Gwendolyn. <laughs> I mean to Gwendolyn. Of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I felt there was some slight error here, Miss Cardew. The gentleman who is now embracing me was my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? <laughs>
dear fellow, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I made arrangements this morning with Dr. Charles Paul to be christened myself at 5 30. And I naturally will be taking the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn will wish it. In any case, I have a perfect right to be christened if I like. There is no evidence that I have ever been christened by anybody. I should have think it extremely probable I never was. It is entirely different in your case. You have been christened already. Yes, but I have not been christened for years. <laughs> yes, but you have been christened. That is the important thing. Quite so. So I know my constitution can stand it. If you are unsure of you ever having been christened, I dare say I think it's rather dangerous to venture upon it now. It might make you very unwell. You can hardly have forgotten that someone very closely connected with you was merely carried off this week in Paris by a severe chill. <laughs> yes, but you said a severe chill was not hereditary. It used to be, but I dare say it is now. Science is making wonderful improvements on things. That is nonsense. You are always talking nonsense. Jack, you are at the muffins again. I wish you wouldn't. I told you I'm particularly fond of muffins. But I hate tea cake. Then why on earth would you allow tea cake to be served your own guests? What ideas of your hospitality? I do not, I've already asked you to go. I don't want you to go. Why don't you go? I haven't quite finished my tea yet. And there are still some muffins left. 